Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the fifth webinar in a series of Promoting Community Mobilization for Harm Reduction Strategies. This is a series hosted by Vital Strategies and the University of Pittsburgh Program Evaluation and Research Unit. I am Veronica Vargas, a program officer at the Overdose Prevention Program at Vital Strategies. Vital Strategies has partnered with Pitt Peru to develop this series of webinars with the objective to promote harm reduction strategies and improve knowledge among community coalitions. We've been collaborating to improve harm reduction as a strategy to reduce overdose deaths, and we also support coalitions to build capacity and implement harm reduction initiatives. We are also working to provide opportunities for coalition members and the general public here in this webinar to learn more about uh, harm reduction strategies and to improve the health and safety of people who use drugs and people with substance use disorders. You can also find other webinar series over at the Overdose Free PA website. And so just for some uh, housekeeping here, please keep in mind that this webinar is being recorded. For our attendees, please stay muted. And if you have any questions, please paste them in the designated Q&A chat or in the general chat. We will be monitoring both and we will uh, address your questions towards the end of this panel. So again, I am Veronica Vargas and I am the program officer uh, for overdose prevention here at Vital Strategies. We will have a panel discussion moderated by my colleague Simran Parikh. Also with Vital Strategies and the Pennsylvania Department of Health. And like I said, we will also move on to a participant Q&A at the end of this session. I would like to introduce our uh, featured speakers today. And so we'll start off with Samantha Koch is a senior project manager at the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency. In this role, Sam provides policy analysis, recommendations, and project support for a variety of statewide initiatives focused on issues like school safety, gun violence, and the opioid epidemic. Prior to joining PCCD, Sam held other policy-focused positions within the Commonwealth, including Director of Special Projects for the Governor's Policy Office and as Policy Director at the Pennsylvania Department of Education. Before working in state government, Sam served in a variety of roles and organizations within the nonprofit sector, including the Clary Center for Security on Campus and the Investment Fund for Foundations. Next up is Alice Bell, who is the project director and co-founder of Prevention Point Pittsburgh's Overdose Prevention Project, working there for over two decades to implement overdose prevention training and naloxone distribution efforts through Allegheny County, including syringe services programs and to the county jail and other community settings. Last year, she helped implement Pennsylvania statewide naloxone distribution in collaboration with the NEXT mailing project. She's also a facilitator for the Opioid Safety Harm Reduction Network and advocates on a state and national level to promote harm reduction-based policy. She's a co-author of several articles presenting data from the past 25 years from Prevention Point Pittsburgh surveys of people who use their programs and has presented numerous harm reduction and poli drug policy reform and other conferences over the last 15 years. And she also continues to distribute naloxone at Prevention Point Pittsburgh's syringe exchange site every Sunday. Up next is Karina Havenstreit, who is the program manager for the Lackawanna County District Attorney's Office. In this role, she developed and currently facilitates the Lackawanna County Overdose Fatality Review Team and a harm reduction expansion of the Naloxone Access Initiative for Lackawanna County, as well as leading and managing other law enforcement and opioid related grants. Prior to her position in the DA's office, she spent six years working in the field of HIV, which began her journey in public health, grant management, and implementation of innovative programs that led her to the role in this panel discussion today. Karina also owns and operates a working alpaca farm in Northeast Pennsylvania, where she lives with her husband and two toddlers. Another of our panelists from Lackawanna County District Attorney's Office is Alex Krupski, and he serves as a data analyst for the Lackawanna County District Attorney's Office. His primary role is the collection, analysis, and presentation of all data gathered by the overdose fatality review team and data related to overdose deaths and gaps in service within Lackawanna County. He also assists with the pursuit and management of additional grants through Lackawanna County on behalf of the DA's office. Prior to his role, he was an analytics manager for a large national managed anesthesia practice and developed numerous analytics programs and initiatives. He's currently eight weeks away from attaining his master's degree in data analytics from Southern New Hampshire University. And recently he's moved back to Scranton, Pennsylvania, where he is excited to be working on innovative initiatives, such as this one to help serve the community he grew up in. Up next, we have folks from the Philadelphia Department of Public Health, Division of Substance Use Prevention and Harm Reduction, 
First up is Jose Caraballo, who goes by JC. JC is the manager of the Environmental Services Department inside the Division of Substance Abuse Prevention and Harm Reduction at the Philadelphia Department of Public Health. The department's mission is to provide support and resources to communities heavily impacted by the opioid epidemic in Kensington. And he also works with Rachel Russell, who is a harm reduction specialist within the Substance Use Prevention and Harm Reduction Division of the Philadelphia Department of Health. She provides education on overdose prevention and manages naloxone distribution to community partners throughout the city. She has also worked with Project SAFE for the past seven years, providing harm reduction services to women, gender nonconforming, and queer people involved in Kensington Street economies. I would also like to now pass it on to my colleague, Simran Parikh, who is a program officer of Vital Strategies and the Pennsylvania Department of Health. She's currently involved in helping the development of strategies for naloxone distribution and supporting overdose prevention and response coordination strategies as part of the Commonwealth's Opioid Command Center. Please welcome uh, Simran and our amazing panelists for today. Great. Thank you so much, Veronica, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, as Veronica mentioned, I'm going to uh, be the moderator for the webinar today, and I would also like to thank Vital Strategies and Pit Peru uh, for hosting this highly relevant webinar on the innovative uh, distribution methods of Naloxon. As you might already know, the prescription opioid and heroin overdose epidemic is one of the worst public health crises in the United States, and Pennsylvania is the third most affected state for it. Uh, Naloxone is a life-saving antagonist opioid overdose reversal medication that comes in nasal and intramuscular form. Uh, historically, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania has implemented sweeping set of initiatives and efforts, including the, the distribution of Naloxon at no cost to members of the general public through Naloxon giveaways, mail order programs, and the first responder Naloxon leave behind program. Additionally, the Naloxon standing order allows individuals at risk of experiencing an opioid overdose and their friends or family members to obtain naloxone through a pharmacy or community-based organization. However, the stigma surrounding opioid use disorder and the need to travel to pharmacies to request naloxone remains a barrier to an individual's access to this life-saving medication. While significant funds and support have been provided by the state agencies, the current pandemic has posed challenges to in-person giveaway events. Uh, the pandemic has also halted the trajectory of this progress, and it has also marked an increase in overdose-related deaths and overall cases. Early during the pandemic, with broad shutdowns of non-essential infrastructure and services, access to addiction treatment and recovery support resources had dramatically dropped, leading to worse outcomes, reduced treatment, and increased relapse and related overdose rates. Although the presence of a standing order has improved access, it did not sufficiently remove barriers uh, to the access of Dalexon. A recent study also suggests that pharmacies struggle to have full stock of Naloxone with them all the time, and some pharmacies are not even aware of the fact that a prescription is not required to obtain Naloxone by in individuals. Thus, there is a need to have discussions and initiatives of innovative distribution methods of naloxone in the, in the state of Pennsylvania. Several innovative approaches to overcome naloxone-related stigma and access challenges have been developed or are in the implementation process in some communities in the United States and abroad. Fortunately, Pennsylvania state itself has also adopted some interesting methods to distribute naloxone. The aim of this webinar is to highlight different approaches to alternate forms of naloxin distribution and discuss how the programs were implemented, how they operate, and highlight lessons learned from our expert panelists here. We hope to share knowledge between all the coalition members regarding different methods in traditional and non-traditional settings and facilitate discussions on this topic. Uh, without further ado, I am pleased to invite our first panelist, uh, Samantha Koch from PCCD, and I would request her to take up the floor and give us some overview uh, of their work uh, and programs related to Naloxone and their learnings. Thank you, Samantha, uh, if you can take it over from hey. here. 
Thanks, Samran. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sam Cook. I work at the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency, which uh, is short named for PCCD. I'm just going to share my screen really quickly. Um, I thought it might be helpful um, to, uh, or I might not be able to actually, so let me <laughs> pop the link in the chat, but um, PCCD since 2017 has managed an naloxone for first responders program, uh, and really the goal of that program has been to increase availability um, of intranasal naloxone or Narcan uh, for first responder groups across the Commonwealth. So we've relied on uh, a network of local centralized coordinating entities or CCEs to support first responder needs um, within their own communities. And most recently, as Simran noted, uh, we did also launch uh, several statewide initiatives to complement those local efforts in the past year or so. Um, I am a data nerd by heart, uh, so I, I do have a couple of statistics that I wanted to kind of bring uh, to the table just to share with you all um, to give you a sense of kind of the scope of the program um, and some specific trends in data that we've been uh, seeing and monitoring in terms of the past year or so um, around naloxone distribution and, and some of the activities that we've been supporting uh, here at the state and, and at the local level. Um, and I'm really excited to see Rachel Russell on this. Uh, just as a side note, uh, she helps out uh, Philadelphia's Department of Public Health, actually serves as the CCE for Philadelphia. So um, it's great to see her on this call as well. Um, so since the program has launched uh, again in November of 2017, CCEs have distributed um, close to 93,000 kits. So those are uh, each two doses of Narcan through our program. Uh, and that included nearly uh, 29,578 kits that were distributed in 2020 alone. So um, 2020 was really a record-breaking year uh, for the program in terms of the amount of Narcan that was able to be distributed statewide. Um, in addition to those kits that were provided by our county and regional CCEs, in 2020, PCCD distributed um, close to 14,000 kits uh, directly to organizations and agencies serving high need communities. We did a lot of that distribution uh, really in the early uh, stages of the pandemic, recognizing that for many communities with shutdowns and uh, limited access to services and more traditional methods of getting Narcan out, we, we wanted to make sure that there was um, a flood of Narcan, so to speak, that was hitting those communities. So, um, so we did a little bit at the state level to support that work last year. Um, these efforts collectively, so since 2017, we do track overdose reversals that are reported um, by our first responders who get kits through the program. Um, and obviously this, this is self-reported data. It's likely um, sort of lower than what the real number is, but um, we've, we've really been um, pleased to see that this program has resulted in at least 17,970 overdose reversals reported um, since 2017. And that number includes uh, close to 5,300 reversals that were reported in 2020. Um, so I, you know, I wanted to highlight, I think last year um, obviously was incredibly disruptive and challenging for, for a variety of reasons. I think what we heard um, here at PCCD from, from our role in working with CCEs um, was really trying to increase flexibility around some community distribution practices and options. So a lot of our programs uh, reported utilizing uh, redistribution efforts and increased leave behind uh, programs. They also uh, took our kits and used them for things like community drive through Narcan events. Um, a lot of uh, CCEs and communities started focusing pretty intently on county jail reentry programs, community giveaway days, and other types of outreach efforts trying to focus on high risk populations within the community. Um, so I mentioned, you know, again, that it was a really a record year. Uh, for distribution. As 2021 got underway, we, we wanted to continue that momentum and really be able um, to supplement and continue support for community groups who um, may be getting some kits from their CCE, but might be looking to get some additional kits from us at the state level to support uh, initiatives that really focused on, on some particularly high risk uh, individuals. So those would include um, individuals using syringe service programs and harm reduction services. Um, so, you know, people who use drugs, uh, obviously uh, looking at folks who are leaving state prisons and county jails, uh, individuals engaged in or leaving treatment, um, folks in recovery, um, as well as uh, individuals who have experienced a non-fatal overdose. So um, we launched the statewide portal in the middle of March um, to date. 
uh, we have been able to already distribute close to 4,200 kits or 8,400 doses of Narcan to community groups um, statewide since that program's launched, and we are hoping that that number uh, will get a whole lot bigger in, in the months and years uh, ahead. Um, and last but not least, um, I know that uh, Alice Bell is on the line as well. Um, we've really appreciated the opportunity to partner with Prevention Point and Next Distro um, to support a statewide mail-to-home naloxone program. Uh, that work uh, predated the launch of the statewide portal. It was something that we started um, in 2020, and, and to date, um, we've been able to provide, uh, I think, around 6,300 doses of Narcan mailed out to individuals in the majority of Pennsylvania's 67 counties. Um, what's exciting to me about that, that partnership and that data um, is that we're able to get a lot of good information about who's requesting naloxone, a little bit about some of the barriers that they might um, be facing. Um, and so just, you know, really quickly, we're seeing that about half of folks requesting naloxone through that mail-to-home program um, are reporting having personal proximity to overdose. 75% are saying it's the first time they're getting naloxone, which is, which is really cool. Um, and then nearly a quarter report being uninsured. So in terms of um, meeting folks with some, some financial and other barriers, um, we think this is a, a really promising program and a promising practice, and we're, we're pleased to be a part of it. So um, Simran, I know that was a lot. I'm sure we'll dive in uh, to other aspects with more detail, but I did put the link to our website in the chat. So if folks want to uh, check out more information at your leisure, feel free. Wow, that was incredible. And definitely PCCD is doing uh, such an impressive work on this issue. And if you also would like to share your screen and show uh, the, the Naloxone request portal, I'm sure that the audience would love to see how it looks and how to access some of the resources on the website. So in case yeah, let's you see if I don't, screen. Let's see if I don't break this. <laughs> Not you put on uh, put you on the spot, but okay, yeah. No, you're good. Um, so this is our this is our website, uh, Naloxone for First Responders. You can see there is quite a lot going on here. Um, so what I usually tell folks to do, there's two spots that I wanted to just quickly highlight. Um, one is if you want to figure out who your CCE is, we have this really cool um, interactive directory and map where you can look. Um, up by address. So let's say, you know, I want to know who's serving Harrisburg. Um, I can click here and it actually can take you and point you exactly to who the CCE is that's serving your community and the point of contact. So this is a really great resource, um, a good starting point if you're interested in getting no cost naloxone. Uh, we always encourage folks to kind of make their first pit stop with their CCE just because they tend to be um, maybe not right in your backyard, but at least closer than, than we are um, here at PCCD. And then Simran, as you mentioned, there is, uh, this is also the website where you go to, to click out to the statewide request form. Um, right. So you can see it's a survey monkey form. Um, I think it's fairly straightforward and easy um, to use, but you can um, see that there's some information about eligibility, some of the priority groups that we're looking to support through that. Um, and so that's the mechanism that you can use to request additional kits through that program. That's that's really good and that's really helpful. And I think this uh, link has also been shared on the chat box, if I'm not wrong. So I'm sure that folks can uh, just you know uh, take a look uh, whenever they want to. Uh, I'm also curious to know that you know we have built such a great website here, uh, but uh, do we have uh, any promotional activities for such resources and tools that the state is providing to the audience? Because I'm sure uh, to reach to uh, the marginalized groups or even the, the, the people who are actually in need of these resources, uh, they need to be aware of, uh, of the existence of these resources. So uh, are we doing any social media practices or any other advertising uh, efforts uh, to promote uh, these resources? Well, I will say, I, certainly the governor's office has sent out press releases. I, I often joke with my colleagues that, you know, unlike us in the state government, not everyone necessarily is like signing up for um, press releases from state agencies. So I think that's a really important um, question and also something that we're very mindful of. I, I can't say enough about how appreciative we've been of partnerships uh, like with Vital Strategies, like with Prevention Point Pittsburgh. Um, there's a million other partners. Uh, I will forget all of them. But I think we've all tried to collectively push out the information from our networks 
Um, I'll let Alice speak to kind of prevention points approach for spreading the word on things like the statewide mail to home initiative. Um, I know that, you know, Karina has mentioned that she guys, she's used like Facebook marketing and stuff. I think, um, Prevention Point, I believe, uses Google marketing, but um, certainly word of mouth and relationships are, are, to me, always the most powerful drivers of referrals. And, and that's not always something that state agencies like PCCD are in the best position um, to drive and lead on our own. So that is why our program really is designed with a lot of local uh, to state networks uh, kind of built in. No, oh, that's great. And the numbers that you provided, like uh, uh, you mentioned that 75% people uh, had reported uh, uh, on the website, if I'm not wrong, uh, on, was it the, 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 there was a relapse of that or they reported of actually uh, hearing it for the first time about naloxone, if I'm not wrong? Getting it was the first time they had received naloxone. Yep, seventy five percent, and that's self reported, right? And um, wow. but I think what's cool about that is that you know for our first responders program, it's it's always been kind of macro level data, right? We can see how many kits get distributed. We can see um, some information about use, but. Um, we don't really know a lot about kind of the, the community members that are on the receiving end of that. And so, um, again, it's, it's a separate thing, but I think it's kind of, it's been illuminating and, um, you know, I've, I've enjoyed being able to kind of uh, track that information in terms of outcomes measurement from a program management perspective. But I'm sure Alice could speak more to that. I don't want to put her on the spot. But, um, again, like I said, we're happy that we really just provide the supply um, and we let Prevention Point and Next do their magic uh, with kind of getting the word out and managing that program. Great. No, I think uh, that's some really good work out there. And uh, on that note, as you had just mentioned about Alice's uh, project here, I would like to invite Alice Bell from uh, Prevention Point Program uh, to tell us about her program, her role, and all the efforts that they are doing uh, for an Alex and distribution and what they've learned from it. Thanks, and uh, thanks for asking me to be part of this. Um, I'm, I'm the Overdose Prevention Project Director at Prevention Point Pittsburgh. Prevention Point Pittsburgh is a um, syringe exchange program in Allegheny County. I've uh, been doing Prevention Point's been doing that work, uh, distributing um, safer drug use supplies since 1995. And we started uh, the Overdose Prevention Project in 2001. Initially just, um, we did trainings in the county jail uh, and provided information about naloxone. And then in 2005, we actually started distributing naloxone. Uh, you would think, you know, a lot of people at this point think that naloxone was invented like 10 years ago or something, but it's been around for 60 years or so. And um, the programs that started giving out naloxone were syringe service programs, the Chicago Recovery Alliance, um, the DOPE Project in San Francisco um, uh, were some of the early early programs to start doing that. And um, yeah, as I said, Prevention Point started distributing naloxone through the syringe exchange sites in 2005. And initially we had to do that with um, doctors and nurse practitioners who volunteered their time and came and wrote individual prescriptions for each uh, vial of naloxone. We give out injectable naloxone and um, uh, and so people could only get it there at the syringe exchange site where there was a doctor to write out an individual prescription. And people had to say we could only give it to people who, who told us that they used opioids. So we worked really hard with a lot of other people around the state to get a uh, state naloxone law passed in 2014. And that really changed um, that, that law allowed for prescribing to what's called a third party. So anybody who was a potential witness of an overdose could get naloxone prescribed to them, which means anybody. And it also allowed a prescription by standing order. So we didn't have to have individual prescriptions. Uh, and, and so that's a situation that, you know, people say it makes it close to being over the counter, not White. You still need to have doctors involved and, and those kind of things. And there's still a lot of barriers. We'd love to see it 
actually over the counter. That would be really helpful in, in making it easier to get it out. But um, uh, what we found in that year after the law passed and we were able to go into community settings. I and mean, we, before that, I, I saw parents who would say, you know, I want to get naloxone. It was basically like, you have to tell us that you use opioids for us to be able to prescribe it to you. And so um, in 2015, there was this huge demand. I personally drove all over Western Pennsylvania doing trainings in all kinds of church basements, fire halls, et cetera, people who were really desperate to get naloxone. Uh, since then, so, so we, we, what we found with that change was that even though we were able to get naloxone into the hands of a lot broader segment of the population, the people who use naloxone were people who use drugs. That, you know, uh, we had last year, uh, close to 900 overdose reversals reported. That's just here in, in Pittsburgh uh, with naloxone that people got just from our program. And um, over 90% of those reversals are accomplished by people who use drugs. And that's the way that it's always been. So we see lots. So, so that's, I think, when you look at the issue, you know, broadening out from local areas from Pittsburgh and Philadelphia, uh, syringe service programs we know are the most effective way to reach that population. And um, the difficulty in reaching people who use drugs outside of syringe service programs has to do with the fact that people are using drugs that are illegal. And so if you go to a Narcan giveaway day, it's more likely that you're going to see people who are service providers or maybe a family member or that sort of thing, uh, because um, people feel like if they go and say, I need to get Narcan, that they're outing themselves as a drug user in those kind of settings. So, um, you know, so in, in syringe exchange programs, people who come there have been coming there to get drug supplies. They don't worry that we know that they use drugs because we already know that they use drugs. <laughs> So that's been, you know, that's a, a big barrier and it's a kind of a, a tough one to overcome as long as we continue to criminalize people who use drugs. <laughs> Wow, that that's incredible, and I loved uh, uh, the uh, about the data that you provided that there were nine hundred uh, opioid reversal reported last year. I think that's really interesting, and uh, the the, uh, the program is definitely I'm I'm sure it has been there since two thousand and one, and it has made so much of progress, and uh, with so many changing laws, I think we've adapted pretty well. I was really also interested to know about uh, any te technical assistance that uh, uh, your program provides to other people. And if you have any advice for any other organization who's also looking uh, to perform similar uh, work out there in this subject area. So would love to know your thoughts about that. Well, I mean, one of the things that we've, we, we have, partnered and provided technical assistance with many organizations over the years. I mean, we worked to get our county jail and to start to start dispensing naloxone, um, which they started doing in 2016. We've worked with hospital emergency departments and other medical providers to provide naloxone. I mean, looking at outside of syringe service programs, the, the most logical place to reach people who are likely to use it are jails, hospital emergency departments, EMS leave behind. We've helped locally here in Allegheny counties. We've helped provide the information and technical assistance for all of those programs. And then, um, uh, yeah, we've sort of been the go-to for anybody that wanted information about naloxone, how to give out naloxone. More recently, uh, you know, Sam talked a lot about this, but um, last year we partnered with Next to try to get naloxone outside of Pittsburgh and Philadelphia, where there is access uh, in other ways to the rest of Pennsylvania, where we've still seen a real um, lack of, of access. And um, uh, so Next does that on a national level, and they partner with various states, 
and, and, and we're the partner in Pennsylvania outside of Philadelphia. Um, uh, the Soul Collective does a, is partners with Next in the Philadelphia area. And um, that, so the challenge there has been to try to reach people who actually are going to use naloxone. And so we, we really look at the requests that people make and um, we do ask people uh, why they're not able to get naloxone in another way. So people who say, I can't get it through a pharmacy, I don't, have a, I'm not, I don't live close to a syringe service program, et cetera. People who report that they've witnessed overdoses or overdosed themselves. So we try to um, find those people and kind of develop relationships with them so that they're helping to spread the word. With the um, launching of the state portal, we um, have a staff person at Prevention Point who's doing technical assistance to reach out to organizations around the state who, to, who are specifically doing outreach in communities of people who use drugs and um, try to make sure that they are getting a, a adequate supply of naloxone either from their local CCA or directly from the state. I think that answered your questions. <laughs> Absolutely. And thank you so much for uh, giving such a detailed uh, uh, answer. I'm sure that it helped everyone uh, present here. And uh, I would also now uh, like to um, move on to our next panelist here, uh, Karina and uh, Alex, uh, who are uh, from Lakwana County District Attorney's Office. And I'm sure that they have incredible information to share on their program, their experiences, and their roles as well. So Karina, on to you. Thank you, Simran. Um, so yes, my name is Karina Havenstreit. I am a program manager at the Lackawanna County District Attorney's Office, and Alex Krupski is also here as well. He is our data analyst. So our naloxone distribution project is on a much smaller scale. We are at a county level, and it is um, an initiative through our Lackawanna County Recovery Coalition, which is co-chaired by our district attorney's office and our Office of Drug and Alcohol Programs, as well as many other amazing community partners that we have as part of our coalition. Um, the initiative that we're going to be talking about today, which is our naloxone distribution initiative, uh, Alex and I were lucky enough to be able to lead and manage that program through our district attorney's office. Um, which I said we're both employees of. Um, I think it's interesting for us in particular, um, I know this comes up a lot that you don't typically see district attorney's offices leading these types of initiatives. Um, so we are very lucky that our district attorney is um, very passionate and very dedicated to combating the local opioid epidemic in our area and um, providing these types of services. So in addition to naloxone distribution and the recovery coalition, um, as was stated, we also last year developed one of the first um, fully identified overdose fatality review teams that's active in Pennsylvania. So we do have a multidisciplinary team that meets monthly um, to really take a deep dive into overdose cases in our county and see what our missed opportunities are and work you know, to build better programming. One of those things is the expansion of naloxone distribution. Um, so through our, our current initiative to try to increase availability of naloxone within Lackawanna County, uh, we do that through the distribution of recovery kits. Um, and, and our kits are a little different than uh, when other people say recovery kits. So in addition to containing the two intranasal doses of naloxone, um, our kits also have quite a significant amount of uh, locally specific resources. So I'm gonna actually share my screen. So you guys, I can show you some pictures of what our recovery kits look like. So give me just a second, bear with me. Okay, so as I said, our, our kits do contain the two doses of internasal naloxone, but they also contain these purple cosmetic bags um, with have our Lackawanna County Recovery Coalition um, logo on them, as well as the website. Uh, we have a refrigerator magnet, which is on the right, which has a bunch of resources for 
um, different local community partners who provide recovery resources within the county. Uh, we have our little purple silicone bracelet that says there is hope with a 24 hour treatment hotline on it. Um, this green bag in the middle is actually, uh, it's a little recovery kit um, and it has a first aid kit inside it. So it perfectly, oh, it's all blurry, sorry. It perfectly fits the two doses of naloxone, um, but then it also has band-aids and antiseptic wipes. I think it has some burn cream in there. I'm just a nice little first aid kit as well. Um, in addition to those resources, we also include a trifold pamphlet for our recovery coalition. And then we also have a front and back handout that we include with all of our recovery kits uh, that was specifically developed for, for this initiative. Um, half of it is information about uh, naloxone, how to use it, a link to a video that we, a training video we developed with our local central coordinating entity who is Pennsylvania Ambulance. So they helped us develop a training video as well as the importance of reporting a life saved or a, a reversal and how to request more naloxone. And then we also included information about certified recovery specialists. Um, so we really think that's a huge piece of effective recovery because the data supports, you know, supports that. So we included information on what CRSs are, how they work, and then specifically to CRSs in the community who are partnering with this initiative and their, their personal stories, why they decided to be our CRSs um, and how to reach out to contact them. So for us, in addition to really having, actually getting naloxone in the hands of the people who need it most, we also wanted to provide those level of resources so that if or when people are ready for recovery, they have what they need to know who to reach out to. And so for us, um, our kits are distributed through three major ways, which I don't think we realized how ambitious that was when I wrote the grant, but we've been really having a, a great time working through it. Um, so our three ways we distribute our kits are through the Naloxone Mailing Initiative, which is what we will be focusing on today. And then we also distribute through community partnerships. So we have a federally qualified health center we work with that distributes through their case management and their Healthy Moms program who works with pregnant mothers with uh, substance use disorder. We are also working with one of our Geisinger emergency rooms to uh, distribute recovery kits through their warm handoff program. And I also just got a call for one of our medication assisted treatment facilities who is also interested in distributing our kits. So we're really, you know, for us, as far as trying to get Narcan in the hands of people who need it most. It's the same thing that was just said, you know, working with those community partners who are utilizing those services and providing the naloxone by mail initiative so people don't have to go seek that out um, and address that stigma that they can just go online, fill out a form, and it's mailed to them in a plain white envelope with a P.O. box return address that is completely unidentifiable. Um, which for us was really important not to write district attorney's office on it. So we made sure to get a PO box to make everything um, very discreet. And we started uh, distributing kits in February of 2021, and we've distributed over 400 so far. So very excited about our initiative and continuing to move forward with some of the other pieces as well. This is great. And this is certainly a very innovative method of distribution. And I love how fancy the kit looks. Uh, it's, it's like, it's so much fancier than a first aid kit. So uh, this is incredible. And uh, that's awesome that you have already distributed 400 uh, since past three, four months. Uh, mm -hmm. I was also uh, wondering uh, about how you have uh, uh, promoted uh, this product. You mentioned, I think, I think we had our conversation uh, last week when you had also uh, told us about some incredible responses you've got uh, on your uh, Facebook page. So do you want to share about that as well? Absolutely. 
Um, so when we launched this initiative, you know, the naloxone by mail is the request forms are all online. Uh, so we thought for us, we thought it made sense to try to target our marketing online as well. So we, we did all of our promotion and marketing for this program through boosted Facebook posts. Um, so this is actually what our post looks like. And you would literally just click on order yours today. It would take people directly from Facebook to our request page. Um, when we originally launched the initiative and wrote the grant, we had anticipated that we would have 100 requests throughout the life of the grant, which was a year. Uh, we did 200 in the first three weeks. Uh, so thank you to uh, Tracy for bearing with me for <laughs> dealing with that insanity and making sure that we met those needs and shifting resources. And um, we, we absolutely did not anticipate the response that we had. Um, so I said this morning, I mailed our 393rd recovery kit uh, since February. So I said we, we definitely had a much bigger response than we thought that we would. Um, however, we did run into a couple of unforeseen things with the Facebook marketing as well. Uh, one of which was our marketing was very targeted to Lackawanna County when we did the boosts. However, the post was shared over 140 times. And once it was shared, it's then shared to everyone that that person knows. So we started oh. seeing increased amounts of out of state requests, um, which led us to discussions with Next Distro as well. So we ended up also partnering with Next Distro to change some of the wording on our request forms. Um, and we now refer our out-of-state requests to them so that they're able to provide resources specific to the out-of-state requests. And we're focusing our efforts on Northeastern Pennsylvania because that is where all of our resources are as well. I um, mean, the other thing is too, um, we're really seeing a slowdown of our requests from our Facebook marketing. So we decided to switch into a different gear. Um, Alex did some great analysis of our 2020 and 2021 overdose data for the county. And we are now going to be starting next week, actually. We're going to have several billboards that will be put up in, in the zip codes of the areas with our highest overdoses, promoting the naloxone by mail initiative. Uh, so we're hoping that that tries to spread the word in the communities that are being most impacted um, as far as fatal overdoses. So that's going to be our next approach to, to spreading the word. So we're excited. Great. Yes, we're excited about that. No, congratulations. You've yeah. made some great progress there. And I'm sure that everyone uh, here at the audience can learn so much from these efforts as well. And as I mentioned before, this is certainly a very innovative uh, way to distribute Naloxone. And talking of innovative, we also have uh, Jose, uh, who also goes by the name JC, and Rachel, uh, uh, who <laughs> are working on vending machine project uh, in Philadelphia. So I would like to invite JC and Rachel to share some of their experiences, uh, tell us about their project, their learning and their role in this. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, yeah, so my name is JC and um, uh, so we essentially um, were really envisioning starting a pilot of this sort. Um, it just kind of unfolded as it did giving that um, we currently um, have public restrooms available in Kensington, but we're looking at more of an unstaffed model, um, basically because of, of the cost that's associated with staffing units. So we place these porta potties that we have in McPherson Square Park, um, which is an area that is like a hub of gravitation for a lot of people who are homeless, but also people who are using substances in the, you know, uh, in, in the public. And we wanted to make sure that we were providing um, we're having medication accessible um, in these porta potties um, just in case um, potentially someone came across someone who's overdosed inside of the unit, but also within the park itself. So we were looking at something that was very cost efficient. If you go to slide two, we found these little, these little containers or like little cubbies essentially that tilt down essentially, which spawn at Harbor Prey, which were about $1.99 a unit. 
and we placed these inside of the porta potties. And what we saw was that, and these actually hold two uh, doses, which is um, which we thought would be just uh, more than enough, essentially, um, for for the units. But what we saw was that we started seeing an increase in people accessing um, the dispenser. And so we went from one box to two boxes, and from two boxes you went to three boxes. Um, um, and essentially. Um, we were providing six doses in the morning and six doses in the afternoon before we left um, the park for the day. Um, and from this itself, essentially, what you see right here towards the very bottom is that we distribute about 300 kits, which it accumulates to about 600 doses that we've given out since uh, January to now, um, just in these uh, porta potties inside the Pearson Square Park. And within this time, there was certain things going on in our vision. We had a naloxone campaign that we were launching. And we were seeing success with this, that the idea came up of maybe it's launching something more um, ambitious across other areas in Philadelphia that we knew we know need, um, uh, that have limited resources when it comes to naloxone. So we considered um, in slide three, which is the opioid emergency kit box um, that is, is essentially you could hold two doses, um, um, but we kind of pulled away from this for several reasons. Um, one was that, Putting these boxes out, we thought we knew people were going to access them, but we were considering what happens to the next participant who comes along to access this box. Um, and we, so the areas that we selected for the pilot that we were going to run was is the third slide, with the fourth slide, which is the uh, Narcan dispensers. But this box itself, we weren't sure whether or not it would be able to provide enough medication to the communities that we selected for this pilot, but also these these boxes themselves tend to sit here over time um, to rust, um, which essentially they're not really meant for exterior use. So we pushed away from this, but also the cost for it is very it's expensive. It's $57 a box. Um, so when we found this, which is a fourth slide, which is the Narcan dispenser, which is through Dispensions Inc., which is a Canadian-based company, um, we found a perfect unit that we were considering for this pilot. Um, and the, the primary reason that this essentially is um, the ideal uh, um, um, uh, unit for, for the pilot that we're running is because of how much we're able to stock in the unit as far as not uh, naloxone. Um, but I'm gonna pass it on over to my colleague, Rachel Russell, who did a little bit more work with uh, Dispension Incorporation when it comes to interface uh, for this unit, but also um, um, other logistical um, um, things that we put together. Um, yeah, so the, the Narcan towers, um, they um, are weatherized units. Um, they hold about 48 doses. Um, and um, we basically, we originally were going to try and pair them with our naloxone campaign ads, um, but uh, decided not quite to go with that, but to try and find like high traffic areas to put them in, but that also um, in areas that we're experiencing like a high number of overdoses. Um, as well as limited access to naloxone compared to Kensington. A lot of our distribution happens here in Kensington because it's kind of the most visible part um, of the overdose crisis here in Philadelphia. Um, but there are lots of other neighborhoods that are affected and other neighborhoods where we've been seeing um, increasing rates of overdose. Um, so we have selected two locations, um, one in West Philadelphia and one in South Philadelphia. Um, and uh, those locations are also um, areas where there are more like Latin, Black and Latinx neighborhoods. Um, he also really wanted to specifically target um, because there is much less than I can access in those areas. Um, but basically the way the, the machines work um, is there's like a screen, it's a very simple user interface. Um, someone will just go up to the machine um, and there will be prompted kind of like if it's an emergency, if they hit yes, Narcan will be dispensed immediately. Um, and also hopefully we're working to integrate this with our EMS, but um, they will be prompted to see if they want to call 911. Um, if it's not an emergency, then it will just take them to like a really short demographic page um, that just will ask for like age, gender, uh, race, ethnicity, um, and your zip code of residence. Um, people also have the option to skip those questions if they don't feel comfortable answering them. Um, and then from there, uh, it will dispense the Narcan and kind of show like a quick explanation of how to use it. Um, but then also all the kits that are inside the machine will come with like more detailed instructions um, and information about how to uh, access additional Narcan besides the actual unit. Um, but um, we're really excited about these because the, 
they're going to be in neighborhoods, um, like I mentioned, where there's a lot less access. Um, we're also hoping to kind of as a promotional feature, kind of like um, like the tags that you use to like swipe into the gym, basically. Um, they will kind of also, they'll also have those. We're hoping to kind of uh, distribute those in the community to our partners um, in doing outreach and also um, potentially like a mass mailing of them um, so that folks can use those both to kind of like access the machine um, more quickly. It can save your like demographics information in a de-identified way. Um, but also um, to kind of help spread awareness of them, of these machines and where they're at. Um, and as well, um, they also will have like a QR code on them um, where folks can go to um, a page and get more information about harm reduction resources and other places that people can access um, more Narcan, safer use supplies and those sorts of things. Um, I'm gonna add something also that that we're able to track exactly how much Narcan is being used in these machines. So we, they fit 48 doses, but um, Rachel, for instance, or myself will be able to log into a portal and see how much Narcan is inside the unit on a day-to-day -day basis. We would get reports that would be sent to us from uh, the suspension sinks, um, but we would have access to that information time through a well, uh, live time feed, essentially. So I think that's also what's really interesting about this, uh, this, 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 this tower, per se, is because we're able to see how much Narcan we're giving out, how much is available throughout the day. And if we have to restock it, we can do it immediately as if we're doing it with other units, it's more like a guessing game, like knowing whether or not it's there or not. And this just gives us access to that information right there and then. Um, and that's, that's what really, um, it's, like I said, that's what really intrigued us about this particular unit was that we're able to see exactly what we're giving out um, but also make sure that we're getting into the hands of people who need the medication. Um, and as Rachel has said, you know, West Philly and South Philly essentially don't have access to, to naloxone, like Kensington does specifically, but some of those communities are, are, are also areas that we want to target and make sure that we're getting the medication to people who need it the most in those areas particularly. That's that's incredible, and uh, I I am uh, really impressed with uh, how you also mentioned about uh, the tracking side and that you're going to get reports. Uh, you also mentioned about uh, that uh, before taking the Narcan out, there's also an option of, of filling kind of a digital survey where people can also write their demographics uh, information as well. So I was also wondering if uh, they can also write their zip codes, like where they belong to just, you know, it could also potentially track which areas uh, within uh, uh, these uh, locations are experiencing the most overdose rate as well. So uh, do we have that uh, system as well? Yeah, so they'll, it'll, one of the questions that'll ask people is for their zip code of residence specifically. Um, so, you know, hopefully we can, you know, and also with actually like talking to people, but hopefully get a better idea um, if there are uh, for other locations, um, you know, assuming that the pilot goes well, like other locations that we could put um, these models, um, but also kind of get a better understanding, you know, like are people more comfortable leaving their neighborhood, you know, to get this, um, right. or do they want this resource more like actually in their neighborhood? Mm -hmm. That's great. And I think what's really interesting to me is that uh, we talked about the, the mail-in re recovery kits and, you know, a distribution of Nalux by the CCEs, but this is a, a very unique model where they have to do it themselves. So I was really curious to know about the storage as well. Uh, uh, does Nalux need uh, or, uh, a particular temperature where it needs to be stored? Uh, is there any research done on that end? I'm sorry, what's the question? I'm sorry, I didn't hear it. Uh, so you have to store uh, the, the Nalix and uh, the Narcan inhalers in these uh, vending machines. So I was wondering if you have to uh, put it in a, at a particular temperature or not. So all the machines yes. will be weatherized yes. um, to try and keep stable temperatures for yes. the Narcan both in the summer and winter. And there would be, I mean, there'd be an indicator on there whether or not it's too hot inside of the mm -hmm. units. So we would get, that would be something that we would log into the portal that we would have access to whether or not um, the, the temperature is at an unsafe level for the medication. 
That's great. Mm. And uh, uh, could you also uh, uh, describe your process behind the research got, gone into this or insights on starting up this program? Because this is uh, definitely very new to the state. So I'm sure that, uh, you know, everyone would benefit from knowing uh, uh, that side as well. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, like I said in the beginning, we really weren't considering launching anything like this. I mean, it just kind of unfolded the way it did. And like I said, when we when we saw the success of like these little cubbies that we bought for $1.99 inside of the, the porta potties, you know, we had an internal discussion about, you know, putting something more permanent in place um, that would be um, working with an Aloxone campaign that we had launched. And, you know, I, I searched for something that would be sustainable and something that we can track easily because we're a small division. And this is what came to mind, or this is what I found that made sense. And this is the first of its kind, like um, Dispensers Inc. does do vending machines and they've done extensive, well, they've done about 15 machines or so for Canada for safe supply um, um, uh, purposes. But this is the first of their kind that they're launching specifically in this particular unit. So, um, but like I said, it was something that, that we wanted to do, but we weren't really looking to do. It just kind of unfolded that way. Um, and when we found this, we were just remar we were really um, intrigued because we can track, like I said, the most the, the important part for me is that we are able to see how much Narcan is going out, and we can see whether or not we're at high supply or low supply, and we can restock it immediately. Um, so, and I think that that's that's you know something that, given the circumstances in Philadelphia and beyond Philadelphia, that we need to be considering is making sure that we have enough of this available in communities that really need it. Um, and having like in slide three, a little box where we have two doses, while we know it's going to be used, the idea is the next person that's coming along and whether or not that person is gonna have access to the medication that they need. Um, and and that's, that's the reason why this model is, and like I said, we don't know exactly how it's going to work. Um, we just finished today, we just got a notification that the payment went through. So we're hoping to have this up and running by end of June, hopefully. <laughs> potentially, um, and we'll have a better sense of how, and within that time, we're going to lay our groundwork for how we're going to do, like Rachel has suggested, um, you know, the outreach for these units, um, but, you know, um, we still haven't installed them yet, but we will soon, which is exciting. I think also just to add, we had internally have been talking about things like these, you know, open access sort of ways for people to get Narcan for free. Um, but, you know, from within our division, there was lots of concerns about like weatherization and like restocking and, um, you know, we always kind of got no's about putting more of these units um, kind of throughout the city, the, the more like in the lockbox type units. Um, and uh, this unit seemed to kind of be the answer to all of the no's, so. <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much. That 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 is uh, really interesting, and I'm sure that uh, someone just commented in the chat box that you know this is such uh, incredible and really inspiring work. So thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, uh, you also mentioned that uh, you know uh, you uh, while doing your research, you came across some barriers, and that's how you uh, finalized that you know we want to launch that uh, uh, this particular project. So that got me into thinking that I'm uh, that. You know, I'm sure that while implementing all these Naloxone related efforts, uh, everyone, like uh, everyone present here from Alex to Karina, Samantha, Alex, all of you might have faced some barriers in implementing uh, these Naloxone related efforts. So I, uh, so my question is to all of you, all the panelists, uh, uh, here, uh, could you share uh, uh, some information on what sort of barriers you have faced and uh, how you have dealt with it? And if you have any suggestions uh, on some strategies uh, that could help everyone here understand on how to mitigate all of those. I don't want to pinpoint anyone, but I remember that barriers were specifically talked by, uh, was pointed out by Alice here. So Alice, do, uh, do you want to start this conversation? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, 
the barriers, the biggest barriers that we have faced it, are barriers to syringe service programs. Uh, Allegheny County and Philadelphia are the only two places in Pennsylvania where there are legally authorized syringe service programs. So, you know, when we look at the, you know, you mentioned that Pennsylvania has one of the highest rates of overdose deaths. And if you look, uh, I know that uh, Peru and Vital Strategies did a webinar a couple of weeks ago on this topic. And Roseanne Scotty presented a map that showed that Pennsylvania is the lone state in the region that doesn't have a state law allowing for syringe service programs. So that is a huge barrier. And I think that that's one of the reasons why, um, you know, we, uh, you know, ha have significant problems in reaching the most important, you know, critical population in Pennsylvania. Um, uh, you know, naloxone giveaway days are a great idea, but, you know, really, I think, you know, you're not reaching the population of people who are most likely to use it. Um, and, uh, you know, everybody should have it, but if, if, the, if the, in the order of prioritizing, um, you know, the syringe service programs are the, the most efficient way to, to get it out there. So that I would say is a big challenge. And then, um, the other challenge is uh, goes hand in hand with that. Just the fact that um, if you're using certain kinds of drugs, you are potentially always subject to arrest. And you know, we talk a lot about destigmatizing drug use, but I, I I'm continually baffled as to how you destigmatize something that you can end up in jail for that makes you a criminal by law. Um, I'm not sure exactly how you destigmatize that. Uh, um, I think that that's, you know, the, the reason why even with naloxone distribution that we can continue to see overdose deaths is because people are so often alone. And why are people alone? Because they don't want other people to know that they're using drugs. So I, I would say those are the two biggest barriers <laughs> that we have faced and continue to face. <laughs> Uh, if it's okay if I could jump in, I mean, I, in our case uh, with the mailing program, one of the barriers that we we dealt with is kind of uh, the perception of the program. Um, Northeastern Pennsylvania, being that we're not a very, uh, you know, urban area, right? Like we're kind of in the middle of nowhere. We're a small town. There's a hundred thousand of us in the entire area. So uh, the perception of the program: Why are people getting this for free? Why? you know, uh, what does this really do? How does this actually help them? Um, you know, for example, like on the Facebook post that we did uh, that was boosted, 99% of the response to this program, I think majority reason why that it was positive is because of how it was presented. Uh, but you know, every now and then you'll still get a comment like, oh, what a shame, or, you know, oh, why is this, what is this for? Or like, why are we supporting, you know, the use of, of illicit substances? Which is not the case at all, right? And I mean, Karina and I even had a, you know, an in-person interaction with somebody um, who was not super in favor of this until we showed them the kit and like, hey, look, like this isn't just a box, you know, with naloxone in it, like there's a bunch of recovery information here. Um, you know, there's a bunch of like resources that these people can, can use for themselves or their friends and family. Uh, I mean, and that stuff, you could see that through the comments, like people are thankful, the people who are really affected by this pandemic, you know, this pandemic of of opioid overdoses are for the program. Um, and I think like the optics of these kind of programs, you know, and that goes for any harm reduction program is always gonna be one of the biggest challenges that you're gonna face in implementing them. That's, that's really interesting. And um, anyone else wants to also uh, share their experience? Samantha, uh, JC, Rachel, Karina, Well, those are difficult to follow. I, I guess I would just say, you know, I was looking at the attendee list. I see a lot of um, familiar names, uh, folks who serve as CCEs. I know for um, a lot of them, you know, their only job isn't uh, serving as a CCE. Some of them are also responsible for setting up vaccine clinics. And um, so, you know, I think just in general, the past year, um, there's been a lot of opportunities to rethink um, kind of rules and guidelines and, and sort of business as usual, which I think is certainly an opportunity. But I, I think just in general, 
Um, you know, it has been challenging, uh, much like really any work that involves face to face or has historically relied on kind of, um, you know, person to person uh, types of supports and networking. I just think the past year has really strained, um, you know, all of us. And so, you know, I think I'm, I'm looking forward to um, seeing as folks are kind of, um, you know, restarting the spring and doubling down on their efforts. I think I've been um, incredibly impressed by how uh, CCEs in particular and, and our other partners have been able to sort of balance um, all of the kind of competing uh, roles and, and, you know, changes in different situations. Um, that being said, I mean, we are coming off of a year with just incredible amounts of um, just death and uh, loss. And so I think, you know, it's, it's something where um, moving forward, you know, we're going to continue to take a look at if, are there rules that are needed? Are there rules that aren't needed? Um, are there things we can do to make sure that, as Alice pointed out, we are continuing to try to do as much as we can to target resources where they are most likely to be used and most needed? Um, but, that, you know, that's difficult um, and challenging work. It's worthwhile, but, but those always come with some challenges. Great. Uh, does anyone else need to add anything? Okay. I have like some of a lot of follow-up questions as well because we have such incredible work going on here. But I also, you know, want to respect some of the questions that are being asked uh, in the chat box uh, because I think we just have a few minutes left. So I really want to, uh, you know, go to some of the questions uh, posed by the uh, panelists here. So someone has asked uh, if any of you have experienced barriers with leave behind naloxone by EMTs. Do we have any answer here? Yeah, are the, is a question barriers to leaving the naloxone behind or barriers to establishing leave behind programs? That's that's a very good question, but uh, I think the person who's written here is just experienced that. I think it's the leave behind the uh, naloxone program uh, that we just talked about previously. So we are going to be launching ours very soon. We're working on um, the finalization of our, we're gonna have a CME certified training for our EMS Leave Behind program as the first portion of rolling it out. So once we roll that out, I can definitely let you guys know what our barriers are. Um, I think from what I've heard in the preliminary development of our EMS Leave Behind program, a lot of it um, is issues with trying to get buy-in. Uh, and, you know, again, everyone is busy. Everybody wants, like, wants things to happen. But also, you know, a lot of times our, our EMS are burnt out and are seeing this every day. So I think um, the approach that we're taking is really education. So as part of our EMS Leave Behind training, we have, you know, a person with lived experience who is going to talk about you know, being saved by naloxone and how, you know, it's important to not give up on cases like him. So I think, you know, we're going to try to, you know, put a face to it and really, you know, use that to try to explain, you know, the point of, you know, if we have programs such as this one, maybe you won't have to go back to the same house seven times. And, you know, maybe there is something else that we can be doing and really try to make it more relatable. So we'll let you guys know how it goes, but I know um, with EMS in general and our preliminary development of our training, I would say that it's that, sometimes the pushback for buy-in, um, as well as the concerns about legality of, whether or not they can get tr in trouble for leaving behind naloxone. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, I also see one more question here, which uh, asks for recommendations for EMS workers or agencies for expanding Narcan, Narcan leave behind to get Narcan to the people that need it the most, which also ties uh, with a question that I had in mind uh, on how to build trust amongst the local community. Uh, and uh, 
and how do we get to people who are most in need uh, and marginalized to actually start using uh, these resources? I, I think in terms of building uh, trust and reaching the people that you need to reach that you have to go to them. That you, you know, it's very difficult to attract people to come to you. I mean, even when you're looking at online um, mailing, um, uh, you know, th there was some talk before about, you know, if you're doing things online, then you do social media advertising. Even in 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 uh, in social media platforms, what you want is you want to find people who are people who use drugs who are sharing it with their community, other people that they know, because that's that, that's who people trust. Uh, um, uh, so I think um, yeah, going going to places where people are and. and uh, you know, one of the things that we've done in addition to the syringe service sites is we've done uh, secondary distribution. So we've hired in, um, in the past four years or so, we've hired a bunch of community health advocates. So people who we provide services to, people who have already been getting supplies from us and who, are, who do give supplies to other people already. And we've been paying them to do naloxone distribution in communities where we don't have syringe service sites. Uh, so, you know, going, going to where people are, that's, that's what I would say. And I mean, it sounds like the, the naloxone tower is another great way to do that. <laughs> that's great. Thank you, Alice. Uh, does anyone else want to also add to this uh, on how to build trust in the community? Because I'm sure that that is one thing that everyone has to, uh, you know, deal with in order to uh, uh, distribute all the resources that we already have here. Yeah, I, I mean, again, from what I've mentioned before, right, like it's definitely very much an optics thing. Right. Um, it's very, very important how you present these things to people. For example, like with the mailing program, um, there's no reference to the district attorney's office. Let's, let's, let's be real, right? I mean, somebody who may be, you know, currently using drugs, right, does not want a package that has the stamp with the district attorney seal showing up their house or a label that says, you know, Alex Krupski sent this to me from the district attorney's office. Not a great, um, you know, not a great look for them. Might make them nervous or, you know, and, and like this stuff is strictly confidential, right? Like no one would ever use this to, to find someone who is, you know, using an illicit substance. Like this is strictly a helpful program, but you know, um, how it appears is, is definitely very important. And I think also to that and to what Alice said too, it's it's those community partnerships. You know, there there's so many organizations that that provide services already and you know who have that level of trust and who are already building those relationships that I think it's important to know those resources within your community and utilize them. Uh, effectively, I said, because like for us, I said, coming from the DA's office, exactly like Alex said, we're not the most reasonable people to effectively roll this out. So our community partners are, are critical for the success of our initiatives. Um, and also, I just wanted to say, I know this was one thing that had come up, if I can just share my screen again, really quick. Um, oh, sorry. Can I share mine or I'm, I'm going to come up? It would over supersede the other one. I just, we did as part of our mailing initiative, we did also um, ask for comments because we were curious to see who would actually be um, utilizing the, the mailing initiative. So I just wanted to share some of those comments with you guys, if, if that would be possible. I do have um, just very, very quickly. So these are some of the comments that we, that we got through our mailing initiative, um, which I think I said, obviously out of you know the 400 that we've given out, not every single one is going to people who are, are using drugs. But I think, you know, by the comments, I was very, you know, happily surprised that a lot of them are going to the people that we wanted them to go to, um, to those people using drugs and also, you know, to their families and to their friends. Um, to people who live 
you know, with them to people in recovery who still have friends who are struggling. Um, so for us, I think having that, that comment really helped us to quantify that, you know, this is reaching some of the people that we want it to reach. I um, mean, it also actually helped us identify some groups that we were reaching that we didn't even know didn't have access. Uh, preliminarily, one of those for us was school nurses. And um, we had a lot of comments about various school nurses, um, about, you know, resource officers on college campuses who were requesting Narcan from us because they didn't have access to it, access to it, which just blew my mind. <laughs> um, so I think that that, you know, having that, those comments has really helped us to shape what we are looking at as our future initiatives as well. So I just wanted to share some of those with you guys. Sorry for taking over the screen. No, this is great. Thank you so much for sharing this. I'm sure uh, uh, this has inspired a lot of people attending this panel. Thank you so much, Karina. Absolutely. And um, I think uh, Veronica had shared uh, her screen of questions that we got from the audience. So uh, Veronica, do you want to take over and read the questions out for our panelists here since we just have, I think, 11 minutes to go now? Sure. So I think Alice asked, oh, what is the name of the company where you're pushing purchasing these lockers? Um, and so I just put it on the screen right now. Uh, there's the website you can go to. Um, and someone also asked, given these Narcan dispensaries, is there a concern that people have access to the Narcan and do not have any information regarding how to properly use it? Are there any instructions and encouragement to contact 911 even before using Narcan? I think that's directed to... Uh, JC and Rachel. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the, the towers will both um, display um, instructions on how to use it on the screen. Um, and there will also be information in each of the kits about how to use it. Um, uh, they also, there's also information to our website where we do like regular online trainings as well that are more um, you know, interactive and visual if people are better learners for that. Um, and then also as far as like encouragement to contact 911, it isn't an option that people can use. Um, the, the screen will prompt people. Um, I mean, this is not finalized yet. We have to make sure that we can not integrate it with our EMS system, um, but they will be prompted if, you know, if it is an emergency and if they would like to, to call 911. Um, and the, the tower has like an integrated like phone feature. Um, but I mean, you know, Obviously, like there are different like reading levels that people have, different access to internet. Um, so we are also like planning to do kind of like extensive outreach in the area where these machines are going to be, um, you know, to try and make sure that people who are in that area know how to use them and know where to access more information if they need it. We've also already done some like pop-up events, like uh, distribution events um, in the sites where these are going to go. Um, and um, we definitely have seen that people want more of this available in their community. Great, thank you. So next question, how can a person become involved with the Lackawanna County Recovery Coalition? I am dropping my email into the chat box right now. So if anyone is interested in that, they can just reach out to me directly and I'll make sure that they have information on our next meeting. Thanks. I'd also like to uh, request that all panelists drop their contact information in the chat for attendees. Uh, um, thank you. And so moving on to uh, agencies who are distributing Narcan, do you have a difficulty time obtaining utilization reports when Narcan is used? Any ideas or recommendations? Um, I mean, that's not I'm sure that our data is underreported, but um, what we do is just, you know, when people come back to get uh, an, to get naloxone, an additional kit, we ask people, did you have to use the first one? And, you know, people are very willing at that point to tell us. I think if you, if you're just asking people to reach out and report it to you, um, that's difficult, again, you know, because of the legality that people are kind of reluctant to say that they used it. Um, same thing with the, with, um, with Next, uh, you know, 
um, when people request a naloxone kit, you know, we ask them if they've gotten, uh, at that point, we ask them if they've used it. And that's, you know, when, when people are in that interaction, then they're more likely to tell you that than just to, if you, if, I mean, if you think about that for yourself, um, it's kind of like, uh, you know, going to the store and then, you know, they send you an email and ask you to provide feedback or something, you're not likely to do it. <laughs> I would have to agree that it's a it's a tough one. Um, so I said for us, like I said, we we do have something we put in every kit explaining the importance of you know why they should tell us. Um, you know, just as far as you know having data and being able to continue to fund you know initiatives such as this one. You know, having that information definitely helps from a grant perspective. Um, and then we do the same thing that you know when they request a kit, it asks if they've used a kit that was distributed by our program, you know, to save a life. So it is a question that's asked, but same thing, you know, how, how accurate that data is. And, you know, I think it's a very, very difficult um, data to, to achieve accurately, but all we can do is try. So we'll keep trying. Okay, thank you. So has anyone made an effort to distribute to businesses such as motels and convenience stores? Has there been any pushback and legal concerns? And I would like to highlight that we do have some contacts at uh, Mike Graphic, who will be on our next panel, actually is doing that work. And so you can contact me if you'd like to get connected to him, but uh, does anyone else on this panel um, like to share their uh, experience? If there's been like Narcan distribution at businesses or motels. There, there was a program here um, that was run through, uh, actually, uh, um, oh, I'm blanking on the name. One of the big Suboxone providers uh, was just, you know, did this on a kind of pro bono basis that they were doing trainings for bars and restaurants and giving kits for a while. There are no legal issues. There, I mean, the, the, state, uh, the state law, Act 139, uh, there, I also saw another question about uh, nurses, physicians, et cetera. The state law protects people in administering naloxone. You're more protected than almost anything else that you will do. It's a very, very broad protection. Uh, it protects you against criminal, civil, and professional liability. So just for that. Um, I also, I know that there was a paper in New York City um, that some researchers did, Alex Bennett and a couple other people did, where they went to um, convenience stores and gas stations and that sort of thing and talked to them about, you know, their willingness to have naloxone kits and they got a very good response. So I think that's a great, that's a great project to do. Um, a lot of that work has been done here um, in Kensington specifically. Um, providing like Narcan and training um, owners of like convenience stores and the local businesses about how to use Narcan. Um, and it, I would say it definitely varies like people's receptiveness to it. Um, you know, some people are you know, very interested in having Narcan and, and wanting to help folks um, because of the stigma. There are definitely people who are, don't want to take that on at all. Um, but uh, we've also done it um, in other neighborhoods in the city, a lot of the bars in Center City um, here. Um, there was an overdose surge among industry workers uh, this past year, and we did a lot of outreach around bars there, and they were super receptive to taking Narcan and fentanyl test strips to have um, for staff and for their, their patrons. So. Um, and so with that, uh, I would like to thank all of our panelists so much. Uh, you've been great. This has been a very informative panel for all of you. Um, we are definitely getting some requests uh, for more information. So I will definitely reach out to our panelists and uh, ask you all to uh, forward me some resources so we can get those uh, to the attendees. And uh, I would also like to flag that we have uh, a evaluation form that uh, is currently in the chat. Uh, and also accessible through this QR code. Uh, our panelists have also shared their emails uh, through the chat again. 
and uh, we do this webinar will be posted online uh, to overdosefreeepa.pit.edu. And uh, I know we received uh, some questions on EMS naloxone leave behind, and we will have that upcoming webinar on June 10th. Uh, so tune in, and we also have a, a diversion uh, centered webinar at the end of June. So thank you everyone. And if you have any questions for follow up, you can uh, contact me at my uh, email here. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here.